Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. We're in a little bit of a different spot today, but I have a really good reason why. I recently celebrated my 33rd birthday, and I got the perfect present for every 33-year-old archaeologist from my husband, which is the Lego Great Pyramid of Giza set. Ah! <laughs> so I thought it would be a fun idea for a video for my channel to do a bit of a time lapse, bring you along as I build this set while also doing a voiceover about the building of the actual Great Pyramid of Giza. A little bit of a meta thing going on today. The Great Pyramid is just one of those things that you look at it and you're like, how did people from 4,500 years ago build something that like this that has lasted this long? And so today I want to answer some of those questions for you. There are about 1,400 pieces in this set. I don't know how long it's going to take me, but <laughs> we will see. Before we get building, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to show your support and also to go and give me a follow over on Instagram at rachelalman.digs. Okay guys, let's dig in. <laughs> the Egyptian pyramids are probably the most famous burial monuments in the world. There are roughly 118 pyramids in Egypt, and they were built during the Old and Middle Kingdoms to house the remains of pharaohs and their families. During the Third and Fourth Dynasties, Egypt enjoyed tremendous economic prosperity and stability. Kings were believed to have been chosen by the gods themselves to serve their, as their mediators on earth. When the king died, part of his spirit, known as his ka, remained with his body and needed to be cared for, leading to the practice of mummification and burial with all of his earthly goods. The idea for the pyramid design we think might have been inspired by the ziggurat monuments in Mesopotamia. Egyptians had started building burial monuments already out of brick, which were called mastabas, in the early dynastic period. The first Egyptian pyramid is the Step Pyramid, built by Djoser in the Third Dynasty. Egyptologists believe this design served as a gigantic stairway by which the pharaoh's ka could ascend to the heavens. The Fourth Dynasty transitioned from the step to true flat-sided pyramid shape. By the Fifth Dynasty, the massive scale and precision of construction decreased significantly. By the end of the Sixth Dynasty, pyramid building had largely ended, and it was not until the Middle Kingdom that large pyramids were built again, though instead of stone, mud brick was used. The ancient Egyptian word for pyramid is mir, which roughly translated means high place. The same hieroglyphic symbols are used to also mean the word benben, which is the name of the mound that rose out of the abyss in the Egyptian creation myth. Pyramid capstones are called the Ben Benet. In addition to resembling the primordial Ben Ben mound, the shape of a pyramid is thought to be representative of the descending rays of the sun. Most pyramids were faced with polished, highly reflective white limestone in order to give them a brilliant appearance when seen from a distance. Each pyramid also had its own name. What we know as the Great Pyramid would have been referred to in its day as Khufu's horizon. The Great Pyramid of Giza and its funerary complex represent the pinnacle of the Egyptian pyramid building industry. At 4,600 years old, it is the only one of the ancient seven wonders of the world that still exists. Initially standing at 146 meters tall, or 481 feet, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world for more than 3,800 years. Inside are three known chambers. The lowest was cut into the bedrock, but remained unfinished. The queen's chamber and the king's chamber are within the pyramid structure. Four additional relieving chambers were found above the king's chamber. Made of granite slabs, we think they were intended to relieve the weight of the stone above to protect the roof of the king's chamber from collapsing. Besides an empty sarcophagus carved of a single piece of granite, nothing else remains inside the pyramid of Khufu's treasures. The funerary complex around the pyramid consists of two mortuary temples connected by a causeway, tombs for Khufu's immediate family and court, which includes three smaller pyramids for Khufu's wives, an even smaller satellite pyramid, and five buried solar barges. 
There are many myths and wild theories about the Great Pyramid, like that it was built by aliens or slaves, or that its actual function is as a time machine. But there's plenty of proof that it was built as a tomb for Khufu by his own subjects. One of the oldest, most prevalent myths about the pyramids is that they were built by slaves. The Greek historian, also known as the father of history, Herodotus, visited and wrote about Egypt 2,000 years after the Great Pyramid was built. He claimed in his writings that Khufu must have been a tyrannical king, and his view was that such buildings could only come about through the cruel exploitation of the people. In the modern world, we still struggle to comprehend how people would willingly agree to undertake such a massive project without the benefit of our modern technology. In fact, archaeologists agree that the workforce of the pyramids comprised several thousand free people, a mix of skilled workers, unskilled laborer farmers, and supporting workers like scribes, bakers, carpenters, and water carriers. In the Old Kingdom, the economy primarily focused on agriculture and was heavily reliant on the Nile. Every year from June to September, the river flooded its banks, depositing mineral-rich silt into the farmer's fields. This was known as the Akhet, the inundation season. Farmers, who would have comprised a sizable chunk of the population, could not work while their fields were underwater, but they still needed to pay their taxes. During this time, instead of paying in foodstuffs as they did usually, they paid in labor, a practice which we now refer to as corvée labor. In the time of Khufu, they would have been sent to build his tomb, functioning as a temporary but gigantic workforce that completed jobs that required manpower but not much skill, like moving huge blocks of stone. While working on state projects like this, all workers, skilled and unskilled, were fed, dressed, and provided shelter at the expense of the state. We even have records that some of the workers who probably live there year round were fed prime beef and fish, making this an attractive job to want to work on. The tombs of the supervisors of the workers contain inscriptions that tell us a lot about the organization of the pyramid workforce. There were two crews of approximately 2,000 workers, subdivided into gangs of 1,000. The gangs were then further split into groups of 200, which were once again split into teams of about 20, according to their skills, with each group having a project leader and a specific task. We know the names of some of these gangs as they wrote them as graffiti on the pyramid blocks themselves and are still visible inside the pyramid today. This name often included that of the king, which is further proof that the pyramid was built for Khufu. Some of the examples of the gang names are things like Khufu Excites Love, or the white crown of Khnum Khufu is powerful. While corvée labor provided sheer manpower, there was also a need for a certain amount of expertise in things like stonemasonry and engineering. This was provided by a smaller skilled workforce that would have worked year round on the project. We have evidence of this from the excavation of nearby worker villages, which are also known as pyramid towns, as well as, as the presence of a worker cemetery. It is estimated that building the Great Pyramid took anywhere between 20 to 27 years, so this would have represented a great amount of job security for someone like a stonemason, especially when you consider that the average lifespan at that time would probably have been between 40 to 50 years old. Unfortunately, the ancient Egyptians did not leave anything behind resembling a dummy's guide for building pyramids. What we do know, we have had to piece together and test out using experimental archaeology. It's important to remember that their techniques would have been developed over time, as we can see that later pyramids were not constructed the same way as earlier ones. To begin the project, first an ideal location needed to be found. The ancient Egyptians chose a natural limestone plateau at Giza, which was probably picked because it was already relatively uniform to begin with. It was then cut back into steps and leveled. Only a strip around the perimeter remains of the leveled surface as the rest is underneath the pyramid. But what we can see and measure shows that the base of the pyramid is level to within 21 millimeters or 5 eighths of an inch. To put that into perspective, the average house foundation in the US is out of level by 5 eighths of an inch. 
Along the sides of the base, a series of holes are cut into the bedrock. These may have been used either for wooden posts that could have helped with the alignment or for using water to level the base. The sides of the Great Pyramid are closely aligned to the four geographic, not magnetic, cardinal directions. Once the base was level, they could begin moving the stone into place. The Great Pyramid consists of an estimated 2.3 million blocks of stone. This equates to approximately 5.5 million tons of limestone, 8,000 tons of granite, and 500,000 tons of mortar. Most of the blocks were quarried at Giza, just south of the pyramid. Special stones were transported on great barges down the Nile from distant locations. For instance, white limestone from Tura and granite from Aswan. In 2013, papyri named the Diary of Merer were discovered at an ancient Egyptian harbor on the Red Sea coast. They consist of logbooks written over 4,500 years ago by an official documenting the transport of white limestone from the Chura quarries along the Nile River to the Great Pyramid of Giza. In terms of the question of how over 2 million blocks were cut within Khufu's lifetime, stonemason Frank Burgos conducted an archaeological experiment based on an abandoned quarry of Khufu discovered in 2017. Within the quarry, an almost completed block and the tools used for cutting were discovered, which included hardened arsenic copper chisels, wooden mallets, ropes, and stone tools. In the experiment, replicas of these tools were used to cut a block roughly similar to what was used at the Great Pyramid. It took four workers four days, working six hours a day, to cut one block. This was sped up by up to six times when the stone was wetted with water. Based on the data from the experiment, Burgos thinks that about based on the data from the experiment, Burgos thinks that about 3,500 quarrymen could have produced the 250 blocks a day needed to complete the Great Pyramid in about 27 years. Transporting the stone is another quandary that has puzzled archaeologists. First, getting the stone just to the Great Pyramid and then up into its proper spot. To get to the site from where they would have arrived via the Nile, the blocks were probably transported by sledge with the sand in front wetted to reduce friction. The droplets of water created bridges between the grains of sand, helping them stick together and reducing by about 50% the force needed to move the object. Another thing that has been tested by real world archeological experimentation. We also have seen evidence of this technique being used detailed in a wall painting for the transportation of a colossus. In terms of getting the blocks up the pyramid and into its final resting place, the most commonly accepted theory is that they used ramps assisted by a lever system. In October 2018, archaeologists announced the discovery of the remains of a 4,500-year-old ramp contraption at a quarry site called Hatnub proving that ancient Egyptians knew how to move huge blocks of stone using very steep slopes. It's entirely plausible that they would have used the same method for building the Great Pyramid as the site dates to roughly the same time period. The stones forming the core of the pyramid were roughly cut and a gypsum and rubble mortar was used to fill the gaps. Creating the mortar material in the quantities needed would have been a daunting task as it had to be dehydrated by heating, which would have required large amounts of wood, which Egyptians wouldn't have had. It has been suggested that Egypt would have had to strip its limited forests and scrap every bit of wood it had to build the pyramids of Giza and other even earlier fourth dynasty pyramids. Once the inner core structure was finished, the pyramid would have been cased and capped entirely in white limestone. Precisely worked blocks were placed in horizontal layers and carefully fitted together with mortar. Their outward faces cut at a slope and smoothed to a high degree. The material of the capstone, the Ben Benet, is widely speculated, but unlike what we see in the Lego set, it probably would have been white limestone as well. All other fourth dynasty pyramids that still have their capstones use white limestone and were not gilded. And we only see this practice of gilding them from the fifth dynasty onward. So what happened to the Great Pyramid after it was built? The Great Pyramid was robbed in antiquity, probably during a period of instability like the intermediate periods when the state would have had had no resources to protect it. The function of the Great Pyramid was also eventually forgotten 
An early Christian pilgrim in 381 AD claimed that the pyramids were made by Joseph to store grain. A few centuries later, in 820 AD, the Abbasid Caliph is said to have tunneled into the side of the structure and discovered the ascending passage and its connecting chambers. In the 12th century, the second Ayyubid Sultan of Egypt tried to destroy the Giza pyramid complex. He gave up after only damaging the pyramid of Menkare because the task proved to be too large. By the close of the Middle Ages, the Great Pyramid had gained a reputation as a haunted structure. Others feared entering it because it was a home to animals like bats, snakes, and scorpions. In 1303 AD, a massive earthquake loosened many of the outer casing stones which were said to have then been carted away for use in other building projects in Cairo. More casing stones were removed from the site by Muhammad Ali Pasha in the early 19th century to build the upper portion of his alabaster mosque. Later explorers reported massive piles of rubble at the base of the pyramids left over from the continuing collapse of the casing stones. In modern day, the pyramids at Giza suffer from a lot of geo-environmental and structural problems. Recently, they've been threatened by massive urbanization and a rising groundwater table resulting from water leakage from the irrigation canals of the nearby suburbs. If you were to visit them today, you would see that the pyramids are flanked on three sides by the roads and neighborhoods of Giza, a major city with a population in the millions. You can visit the Giza Plateau, but only a small number of people can enter the Great Pyramid each day, and you're not allowed to take any photos inside. If you're feeling hungry, there's a pizza hut a quarter mile away with a great view of the site. Ta -da! Okay guys, that's it. I have finished building the model. It took me about four hours split over two days, which is why I'm in a different t-shirt and hairstyle, <laughs> which I think considering how long it took the original pyramid builders to make theirs, I've made pretty good time. I really enjoyed the process of building this and also just making this video in some kind of like educational type content for you guys. I think they've done a really good job with the model. I particularly like how at the back they have basically put the plan of the chambers inside the Great Pyramids. You can kind of see that. And then as well the fact that they have the process of building the pyramid and then the look of the final finished pyramid. The model itself is not entirely historically accurate, but I think they did a really good job. There's three smaller satellite Queen's Pyramids outside of the Great Pyramid, not just two, and the mortuary complex is a little bit bigger. I think it's really cool that they included this like workers village, I presume that's what it's supposed to be, but here it makes it look like it's the banks of the Nile coming right up to the Great Pyramid. This is not what it's actually like in real life. The causeway itself leading to this mortuary temple that we have here, it did exist in antiquity. There was a causeway linking two temples into the complex, but it would have actually linked to what was essentially like a false harbor that they would have created with canals and everything, siphoning water off from the Nile. Obviously, the purpose of this would have been so that they could have sailed all of their building materials and then probably eventually the sarcophagus of the king basically right up to the building and then taking it up the causeway and put it inside. But I think they've done a really impressive job with this. I enjoyed building it. I'm gonna enjoy displaying it amongst my other Lego things that I have. If you liked this video, please don't forget to give me a thumbs up. If you would like to see more from me, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button so you get notifications whenever I put out new videos. Also feel free to go and give me a follow over on Instagram. I post lots of different and extra content on there. Big thank you to Lego for making such a really cool set for me to build and to my husband for buying it for me for my birthday. I love you. <laughs> I really hope in future that we can see and build more sets like this because I think it's a really great educational opportunity for communicating history in a kind of non-traditional way. Thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!